Welcome to another episode of On Target. Today we're joined by, by Moy Shams, an award-winning sales leader at Gartner, who's known for his relentless pursuit of personal development and commitment to raising the bar every single day. With a focus on leadership excellence and guiding high-performance teams across emerging markets, get ready for an enriching conversation. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right in. Moy, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks very much for having me, Alex, and thanks for the kind introduction. Absolutely well deserved. Now, Moy, salespeople need an elevator pitch day in, day out, I'm sure, as you're representing your company and beyond. So if you had to give an elevator pitch for yourself in 30 seconds or less, tell us how you'd introduce yourself. <laughs> great way to open it up, Alex. Uh, so the way I describe uh, myself or an elevator pitch would be, um, first and foremost, I'm a father of two children, two beautiful children. I'm a husband to a loving wife, and I really do strive to live a purpose-driven life, um, a life on my terms and for a sickening pursuit of development of me becoming the best version of myself. And at work, the way I would describe it is, you know, I'm responsible for building a culture of collaboration, a culture of high performance, where I'm focused on uncovering and helping my team to get the maximum potential out of themselves. And the way we do that is we really try to understand what motivates them, help them put a plan together and execute. And so that's essentially what I do in, in terms of contributing towards the company goals and mission. Absolutely. Love the pitch. There was a lot to unpack in that. So let, let's talk a bit about your story, Moy, both both personal and professional, whatever you're comfortable leaning into. Uh, walk us through the journey itself and maybe highlight some of your biggest lessons and learnings throughout that journey today. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'll probably start at university because um, that was really a character building moment within my life. Um, and then I'll kind of share a, a personal story of myself, which was uh, life transformational for me. Um, so at university, you know, I, I studied business information technology. Um, the reason why I decided to do that is simply because I had no idea what to study. And so I asked my dad and he said, look, IT seems to be the future and business is always going to be around. Why don't you do this degree? So I said, fine. And so um, I went into university and um, I always had it in my mind that I wanted to work for a corporate organization. I always had this Im image in my head of being part of a group where there's professionals, there's suits and ties, and that's kind of what I wanted to get into. And so I, actually, even before I started uh, university, I kind of wanted to go down that route really, really fast. But I went to university and so I did a um, I did a sandwich degree. So, you know, two years study, one year internship, and then you go back to do your final year. And, um, you know, I was quite fortunate. I got in with a group of guys that were, you know, really like to have fun, but also work hard. And um, so we came towards our third year um, to do the placement year. And, you know, one of my really good friends had secured an internship at Deutsche Bank. So he was set. Another friend of mine got uh, an opportunity in investment bank and I was kind of there left on my own. And I remember I applied, you know, through the placement office at university, um, a role at uh, Toyota as a marketing intern. And I prepared so well for it. You know, I had friends of mine that had actually worked as Toyota with a client. I had all these Japanese quotes and, you know, to go in and really impress them. Basically, I didn't get that job and I was disheartened. I was really disheartened. And then an opportunity came up at Gartner. And I had not never heard of Gartner. Um, so I went for it anyways, and it was a database marketing intern role. So the task that I had was basically to manually unsubscribe people that would say, we don't want to receive an email from you. So that was the main main job of what I did. Anyways, I, um, I did my internship at Gartner, and um, I'd absolutely fallen in love with the working environment. I fell in love with the kind of people, the culture, the environment. And I was, I just decided that this is where I want to be. This is kind of, you know, the environment I want to be in. Anyways, I come to the end of that internship, the year long internship, and I was going to go back to do my uh, final year uni. And what happened is I, I, I kind of told myself that, look, I need to maintain some level of connectivity with this organization. Once I go away, 
I'm not going to necessarily have something guaranteed off the back of it. And this is the the kind of financial crisis. So this is in like 08, 09. And so, you know, jobs were scarce. And my friends had secured full-time jobs at Deutsche Bank and all these other things. Anyway, so, you know, I had basically networked my way around and um, I got a kind of a contracting gig. So to attend all the conferences that this uh, Gartner had. And so I would basically go there, I'd scan people's badges, you know, again, really low level kind of work. But, you know, I had got myself out there and I had the opportunity to network with people. And then I bumped into a lot of sales folks. And, you know, as I started to talk to them and, you know, started to see what they were doing, how they're interacting with clients, I was like, that's kind of where I want to be. And then I started seeing their nice cars and their flashy watches. And I was like, oh, that's really kind of what I want at that time. And so anyways, I um, went back to uni, so I was doing this contracting gig in my final year. And um, eventually I managed to, um, the, the easiest way I can say is I blagged my way into getting a, an interview for an entry-level sales role. And at that time, there was probably about 30 people in this uh, mid-sized enterprise division in the UK. And the average tenure of people, the average age of people was about 30. And so I was this, you know, grad, I hadn't even graduated. Now we've got these full-blown graduate programs. At that time, we didn't have any grad programs. And so anyways, I went into this interview fully prepared, you know, had people that, you know, helped me prepare for the interview. I had about eight people in that interview, um, all managers, all hiring managers, and one of the VPs who led the whole division. And um, at the end, you know, I went for my, my compelling close. I said, based on what you've seen, would you offer me the job? And so I went around the room. Every single person said no, no. No, no. Wow. I'm like, oh God, I'm, this is this is tough. The last person, Simon Ebden, um, I said to him, you know, would you offer me the role based on what you've seen? He said, yeah, I would. I'd give you a shot. And so I was absolutely elated. I was like, brilliant. So I went off, um, you know, did my final exams, and I pretty much had a job in sales, entry level, secured once I'd graduated, once I finished my degree. Anyways, we went to, um, so, you know, obviously, as you graduate with your friends, you typically go on a little bit of a holiday. So we went to Dubai and uh, my sister had just moved the year before. Um, and so we had a place to stay for a week and then we were going to go to Thailand. So I went with one of my best friends who'd, who'd got a job at Deutsche Bank and I had secured this Gartner role. So I was super happy. Anyways, we had an amazing time in Dubai. Um, you know, it really opened my eyes, even though this was at the heat of financial crisis. You know, we, we, we were just like young and really excited. So I had a brilliant time. On the last day, um, we decided to go jet skiing. And um, in Dubai in itself, it was actually banned. And so we had to go to a nearby Emirate in Sharjah. So we went to Sharjah, paid a little bit more money, got the upgraded jet skis, and we're having a blast. And right towards the end of our session, um, we basically, you know, boys will be boys. We're having, having a lot of fun. I had a head-on collision um, with one of my friends. And so the jet ski basically went over me. And what happened is I'd fallen into the water, had my life jacket on, and I was drinking up all this water. And my brother-in-law was there. And so when he saw it, he jumped into the water. And, and this is why, you know, what he told me. He jumped into the water and he said, as he got to me, there was all this blood around. And when he looked at me as I'm drinking this water, he could see right through my neck. And he, he said he froze. And wow. my friend that was also in the water slapped him around the face and he said, get him onto the jet ski. So these two guys are trying to get me onto the jet ski as I'm drinking up this water. I've had this major accident. I get to the side of the beach. Um, they take me in ambulance. I get to the, uh, to the hospital. And the only thing that I remember as I was in and out of consciousness um, I, I feel this cold, you know, scissors up my, up my leg or utensil up my leg and they're cutting my shorts. After that, I can't remember anything. And so I basically, I fell into a coma and I was in a coma for a couple of days. So I was on a life support machine. Um, and it's pretty serious. And the doctors had, uh, recommended for my parents to fly out to Dubai, um, because I was in critical condition and they didn't actually know whether I was going to wake up. Or if I did wake up, what my condition would be. And so I'd woken up and I remember I was somewhat paralyzed from the left-hand side of my body because I'd broken my jaw, my C2 bone and my neck as well and clips and nerves. And so I couldn't really move the functional side of my left body. 
Anyways, as I wake up, I remember hearing a beeping noise. I had the life support machine. I had the tubes down my throat so I couldn't talk. And it's so surreal, whether it was the drugs or whether it was my mind playing tricks. I remember a voice that said, can you hear me now? And I vividly remember that voice and the saying of, can you hear me now? And to me, as I reflected on that later, and as I came out of the coma, came out and recovered pretty quick, miraculously, because I had a lot of people praying for me, I had a lot of um, you know, support around me. That was honestly life transformational for me. It set me off on a lifelong journey of understanding why have I been given a second chance? You know, why am I on this planet? What am I here to do? And in all honesty, it was a really humbling experience when I look back at it. I mean, it wasn't at the time, but I was pretty cocky. I was really arrogant and I was quite flashy with a lot of my materialistic things that, you know, I'd got through my student loans and stuff. And that was quite a humbling experience because it really was kind of getting me to self-reflect very deeply around what's my purpose and really why am I here? And so it wasn't like an immediate, you know, change in my life. And it was a gradual process of now when I look back at it, I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but it was basically me discovering myself, understanding my values, understanding my identity, understanding really who I am and what is it that I want out of life. And so that was essentially a really pivotal moment. And then anyways, fast forwarding, I got back to the UK. I'd essentially damaged my voice box because when they took out all the tubes, I couldn't speak. So I had a really squeaky voice. I told the recruiter that, listen, this is what's happened. I'm going to need about three or four months to recover. That job had gone. <laughs> they had to fill out sales roles. I'm like, crap, I have to start all over again. And this is in the height of the financial crisis, right? Anyways, I went back out prospecting and, you know, got another job, a really low level job. And lo and behold, I got a call from Simon. And he said, listen, I've got a vacancy open. If you want it, it's yours. And I, I'd only started for one day in this new organization. I felt terrible for that owner. And if he's watching, you know, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but I had to leave and I said, look, you know, I have to join the company I really wanted to join eventually. And so I moved on anyways. That was my kind of, you know, journey into the professional organization, into sales. Um, and then, you know, I did a number of individual contributing roles. It was really brutal, really tough, but incredibly rewarding. And I learned so much about myself. You know, I, I achieved top 1% a number of times, President's Club. Um, again, but I learned the most through my failing, failing years and the, and the toughest years I had. That's where I really learned the most about myself. And then, you know, I decided to kind of, you know, move to Dubai, which was really a, a plan I had for three years. And it took me three years to, to, sorry, I had a goal of moving to Dubai, but it took me three years to get there. Um, and then I moved into leadership and then I've kind of, you know, grown this region um, from zero to building a team. Now we operate in nine different countries across emerging markets. So that's my story, Alex. Boy, I, um, I almost want to just pause and thank you, really. First and foremost, and the reason I say that is that your story has so much power in it and you feeling comfortable enough to share that not only with me, but with the audience. Uh, I think it says so much about uh, you and your character. Um, it, it says a lot about your desire to positively impact others. And I really, really hope that people replay that story over and over again, because there are so many incredible lessons to take away from that. The, the piece that I really want to double tap on and, and better understand is that you said that going through that experience in your life really made you ask a lot of questions about yourself in terms of why am I here, purpose, these types of things. Where, where, where have you gotten to in answering those questions now? And how did that impact the rest of your journey up until this point? Yeah, great question. Um, look, I, I'm at a stage in my life where, you know, I, I, I do a lot of personal development. You know, uh, I, I set aside $5,000 as a budget every single year to invest in courses to learn more about myself. So I, I would classify myself as a lifelong learner. Um, and I think you know, one of the things that's really helped me is not only get clarity of where I want to be within my career, <clears throat> but all aspects of life. And 
you know, life is not just your career and your work. It's your health. It's your finance. It's your relationships. It's your spirituality. It's your personal growth as well. And so there's all these other aspects of your life that, um, you know, since then I have really got more clarity of in terms of goals and where I want to get to in these different um, really important areas of, I think, of anyone's life. And often we neglect it because it's all about work and it's all about career and becoming the best within your career. And oftentimes it's quite measurable. You know, you want to get to this level, to that level. Even finance can be quite measurable. You want to get to this goal, to that goal, <laughs> to accumulate a car a house, whatever it may be. But the other things that are so important, like your health, your relationship, your family, spirituality, all of these things provide layers of meaning to what you do. And it fuels you, not only within your career, but all other aspects of your life. And so where I've got to is I'm always evolving this, you know, and I'm a big believer of documenting things. I've literally documented all of these things and I have clarity of goals in terms of where I want to be in 10 years, five years, three years. And I revise that regularly because it gives me certainty and it gives me a direction as to where I'm going. And that's kind of where I started. I strive to live a purpose-driven life, a life on my terms. Because once you're clear on your own values, your own belief system, you can start tweaking that to go in a different direction if you choose to. But most of the times when I'm mentoring people or speaking with, you know, you know, um, ambitious sales folks, they often don't have a level of clarity as to where they're going. And it, and it, and it, it really baffles me. Even uh, older people, even people that are maybe 40, 50 in their careers, it, it's like they don't have exact clarity of where they want to get to and what they want to get out. And it's like, a, it's like you getting in a car. And, and you kind of just aimlessly driving this car with no destination. You often need to have a destination to before you get into the car and drive. But what I find a lot of people do, even in their career, let's just take career. They get in the car, whatever comes their way, and they just drive. And let's see where you land. And so, you know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned is have clarity of where you want to get to. Have clarity of that destination. Have clarity of the outcome. Try and identify what's really important to you right now. Because what was important to me when I started out my career to what's important to me now, it, it varies and it alters. You know, money was such an important thing for me back then and accumulating cars and watches and things like that. To now, it's more about experiences for me. It's more about relationship with my partner, with my kids, and also the type of impact that I have on people. So I think having clarity and you having a regular touch point throughout your career is really, really valuable for you just to touch in with yourself and go, doing what I'm doing, am I still loving it? Is it still aligned to my values? Yeah, I mean, there's um, there's so many interesting facets about that, Moy. I, as I reflect on a lot of what you're talking about, I try and put myself in the shoes of someone who might be listening and saying, I, I feel inspired but what can I do tactically to really start to find that sense of clarity? Now, I know you're saying, ask yourself these questions and, and, and look inwardly. I, I, I get all of that. I wonder, is there anything tactical? Are there any things that are that little bit more specific where now with the benefit of hindsight, you could say, well, if I took these intentional steps or I did these intentional things, I believe I would have gotten to that clarity faster or more effectively. If, if you have anything in mind, please share. Great, great question, Alex. So taking this and practically executing it, and what would I do if I was to do it all again? The first thing that I would continue to have done, which is what I did is, you know, invest in development courses, in goal setting courses, in, the goal, you know, all the different sales, tactical kind of stuff as well. Invest in training and development. And especially if you're working for an organization that doesn't prioritize development of people, you have to go out of your way from the commissions that you earn, figure out what is going to be the most valuable training course or development area that's going to add to your toolbox because it's going to pay massive dividends. Warren Buffett says the best investment you can make is in yourself. And if you consciously, if your company is not doing that, you've got to do that for yourself. If I was to do it all over, all, all over again, 
what I would have actually done is I would have got myself a, a professional coach, either a sales coach, a career coach, a coach to help me clarify some of these things and guide me to figuring this stuff out for myself. You know, I took so long and I still, you know, I'm still going through this journey myself as well by, by far the finished product. But I had to figure all this stuff out myself. And so that's the two things that I would do. Invest in your own training and development, even if your company doesn't do it. And most organizations have the resources. You have to be hungry to go out and get it. You know, the amount of times people say to me, oh, I'm lacking growth in my current organization. And I think to myself, you know, do you not have senior VPs that have been there, done it? Could you not reach out to them, grab a coffee, you know, network with them and understand how you can learn from them? Could you maybe approach your VP for a particular course and get the company to pay for it? Because you can demonstrate the direct impact it can have on your sales performance. People sometimes are just in that box and you've got to think a little bit more creatively. You've got to, you've got to be more resourceful to get really what you want. So they're the two things I do. Invest in training and uh, get yourself a coach. That's that's really, really helpful. I, I want to add a point from my own experiences on this and then I want to switch gears to talk a bit more about your experience being one of the first on the ground in Dubai and, and, and building a region, building a team. The, the point I want to add, first of all, is that uh, long-term listeners will know that I align to Stoicism as a philosophy. And and that's a call out to say for, for others who also may feel a little bit lost around that sense of vision or purpose or clarity. One of the helpful starting points is to look into various other philosophies out there and try and understand if any of them give you a good core grounding from which to say, actually, this philosophy is something that I can align with, something I can identify with, uh, uh, and the character traits that that philosophy may encourage will help just to give you at least a starting point to say, well, I align to stoicism as my baseline, and then I'm going to figure some of the other things out a bit like the, the points that you've mentioned in terms of coaching, mentorship, and more. The other thing is I, I want to double tap on that premise of coaching. Um, as I'm on this uh, podcast right now, I've got about four or five coaches for different aspects of my life. I've got a, a calisthenics coach. I've got a homeopath. I, I've got a stoicism coach. Uh, I, I've got coaches in almost every different facet of my life from health and fitness to mindset and beyond um, to strive towards greatness and excellence and get those 1% edges in every single aspect of life. And so when you start to look at these things, you, you don't have to figure everything out alone, um, right? Get the support, as you say, be creative, uh, lead from the front and go and go and figure these things out and learn from people that have gone and walked uh, these types of journeys before. So uh, I love all of this conversation so far. As mentioned, Moyen, I want to switch gears and, and take you back to that moment where you landed in Dubai. It sounds like you were pretty much first on the ground and you had a lot of things to figure out. So to bring us into that first three to six months, what did that look like and how did you set up the region for success? Yeah, so there was already an established team in the region. So I was essentially, you know, one of two that had come over from the UK as an internal transfer. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was part of a team as an individual sales contributor. And I remember um, I, the previous year I had, you know, I did really, really well in my UK role. I, you know, top 1%, something in our company is beyond President's Club. It was something called an Eagle Award. And so I had done everything. I'd wrapped up because I was so clear that I wanted to move to Dubai. This is kind of what I want to do. So by November, so we've got a calendar year. By November, I was done. I, I'd completely smashed it. And so the whole month in December, I started prospecting. Um, I started getting ahead of the curve and I contacted my new manager in Dubai, got my territory, started prioritizing, started campaigning, started reaching out in December when oftentimes people are switching off, you know, getting ready for Christmas, New Year's. And then, you know, with a oh, slowly get into, this, into January, I was out of the gate straight away, you know, before I even officially started the role. And that really helped, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And so come February, I think it was, I closed my first deal already. <laughs> and so I was, I was on a bit of a high and everyone was like, wow, who is this guy? But then what had happened is I had a really dry patch for a very long period. I don't think I closed my next deal until August, September. And there was 
concerns about, you know, my ability to adapt to the region. And so the first three to six months was really, really challenging. The approach that I was taking, it was quite a scientific sales approach, which I had really, I think, mastered really well in the UK. And so I had my elevator pitch documented and memorized and it will come out so naturally. I had my line of questions. I mean, it was so scripted, but it was so clear in my head that it will come out naturally. Uh, those talk tracks didn't necessarily resonate with the market that I was serving here. And so I had to very quickly unlearn a lot of the stuff that I had done in the UK and relearn the way in how I was going to do it here. And the one common thing that I had kind of almost um, uh, dropped the ball on is this one commonality amongst every single person. And we're all humans and we connect on a personal level through storytelling or being genuine and actually genuinely wanting to understand the challenges, the concerns, the problems. I think at some point I had kind of lost that and I was going through this very scientific approach because the pressure was building and I'm trying to stick to this scientific approach of how to go about selling. And I forgot the human side of it, which was my one of my natural skills. And so I started to bring that back to the forefront and, um, you know, still doing the leading indicators around pipelining because actually when times get tough for me, I just, you know, double down, I hunker down and I work even harder. As one of the things that I, I feel has kind of got, got me to where I'm at, which is always wanting to be the hardest working person in the, in the room. And that is what I think differentiates myself, my work ethic, you know, at, whether it's at work or whether it's, you know, personally as well. And so um, that was kind of my journey, you know, when I moved to Dubai and, you know, I, I really wanted to move into the leadership role. And so um, I understood, I'd been told that, listen, you've got to do, a, I, and I'd been offered a, a managerial role in the UK or this Dubai offer. And I went to Dubai um, as an individual. And so um, I was constantly investing in myself with mentors, you know, as I was in Dubai, trying to understand the market, trying to ad adapt. And so I did really well, actually. In the end, I, you know, I achieved President's Club. And to my surprise, there was a number of managerial roles that had opened up. And so I thought, let me throw my hat in the ring anyways, even though I'm not really eligible for it, I need two years minimum. And I managed to get the role, uh, which was great. So then I got into, into the leadership role, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and so that was my kind of, you know, first year at, at uh, in Dubai. Fascinating. Fascinating. There's a point that you mentioned, Moy, around uh, leaning into your, your human side and, as you described it, your natural skill set. What I'm curious to understand is that uh, for your team and the teams that you've built, you know, over time and up until now, how do you foster, enhance and develop uh, what you describe as natural skills versus alignment to leading indicators, right? Because there's a there's a clearer play to helping someone to become more effective against leading indicators. That that path doesn't sound as clear when you're trying to harness quote unquote natural talent. So could you just talk to the separation factor between the two? Yeah. So uh, when it comes to hiring people, um, you know, what we call as traits or innate character characteristics or whatever, there's a couple of traits that uh you know i look for and we typically uh, look to hire and so one of the things that's incredibly important is hunger drive you know that self-motivation as i described right and being able to articulate that to a point where it really gets you up in the morning you know and it's not that surface level motivation around a car or watch which is all fine it's all good but it's like well why why is that important why do you want to get that Porsche or why do you want to get that watch or why do you want to get that house or that promotion? What really sits beneath that? And so we get into a lot of that stuff, right? So the other things are, um, and, and you know, oftentimes that comes naturally for a person or they've gone on this self-discovery to uncover it for themselves. I believe that, you know, um, the trait of drive, will to win, motivation is inherent. But I think as really skilled coaches and leaders you can ignite that within a person as well. You can ignite that potential in people, but it really has to be driven from the person. It can't be imposed. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, when we're looking for those characteristics around co competitiveness, right? 
naturally, you've got to be somewhat competitive in a healthy manner to want to either better yourself, become the best that you can, because that's naturally going to get you driving and, and not give up. That's the kind of inherent trait, so to speak, you know, that persistence. But, you know, can some of these things be coached in terms of skills? I think, you know, they've got to, they've got to naturally come from an individual as part of their character, but you can provide more awareness of these things as well so people can work on it. And, you know, like, like you, you've got all these different coaches to, you know, get really good in these different specialized areas in your life. You've almost got to have a coach to, you know, extract that and get that out of you as well. You've got that within you you've got that drive you've got that motivation that competitiveness is is obvious and to take you to that next level you want to be in an environment or surround yourself with people that can get the best out of you and so i think that that's kind of you know how we go about you know i guess building teams hiring people and cultivating that drive in, in individuals and one thing that i'd really kind of want to touch upon is you know culture you know culture within sales environment and when we talk about you know high performance cultures how do you break that down? In the simplistic way, culture is really built on a set of values or beliefs that a group of people have, and that's the way they show up. And so how do you create that kind of high-performance culture? It's not just good enough to say, yeah, we're a high-performing organization, we're going to grow double-digit or whatever it may be. You've got to live and breathe those values, and sometimes you've got to be very conscious of those values in the first place as a leadership a group as a leadership team as the leader so for example i'll give you an example you know for us winning as a team is a core value of us collaboration is a core value for us breaking records is another value of us fun and growth what i mean by growth is this strap line and mantra that we have in our region around becoming the best version of yourself now it's all well and good me saying all those things but we as a leadership team celebrate these values regularly you know, one of the bits of feedback I get from people that join our, our region, they uh, I ask them, you know, new hires, what's the one thing that really stands out? They all say everyone is so collaborative. Everyone wants to help. And that's because, A, we hire great people. But secondly, it's because we celebrate that. We put structures in place that enable people and want people to collaborate and help one another. Actually, my top salespeople they are the most collaborative and most open in sharing their proposals and capability decks and you know how they structure their discovery call. They're the ones that are most willing to share and give. And then what it does is it just helps them grow even more. And so I think you know a big element is when you're creating high performance organizations is to have these set of core values that you live and breathe. And then you've obviously got the expectations, you've got all those other things that under uh you know sit underneath those core values and in, in terms of how you live and breathe that that premise of living and breathing and the repetition and continuing to really invest in and foster that culture is so incredibly important i, I see so many organizations have um you know a, a list on the wall or a list on their website of uh, what they claim to be their core values but you, you turn up and you you just don't see it you don't feel it right and it makes a, a huge huge difference when in every meeting and in every interaction you continue to lean into those principles to make sure as you say the team are living and breathing it that's really the only way that you're going to foster a, a, a culture that has some form of depth uh, and that's going to be able to sustain over time versus just being a, a list of some words on a wall that that look good publicly. Um, so really, really good call out there. I, I want to now talk a bit more about how you set up your own week for success, Moy. If we got to peel back the curtain and get a sneak peek as to what your, your calendar looks like, a typical day or week in the life, uh, help us understand your operating rhythm that's allowed you to perform at such a high level over an extended period of time. Yeah, so I use my calendar uh, all the time. You know, I have everything in it. I have prep time in it, um, you know, travel time blocked out. I have everything structured and scheduled in my diary. Um, so my Monday uh, is quite a normal Monday. I, you know, I'm an early riser. Um, you know, I try my level best to at least go to the gym three times a week. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. I've got two active kids and sometimes I, I prefer, I choose to kind of get them ready, take them to school and stuff. 
But Monday is typically a structured for me around the leading indicator review. You know, we'll do the analysis around pipeline at a manager level. And so I'll share that report out to the team. We'll have our VP meeting. So I'll get an insight in terms of at a management level, exec management level, what's going on. Um, and then I'll have my direct report manager meetings as well um, and set out the priorities for that week, the following week, um, and kind of, you know, go through that discussion. Tuesdays to Thursdays is really around my line of business meetings, whether that's with legal, recruitment, services, marketing, finance. Um, and so that's a massive part of building a high performance culture, you know, making sure you've got a regular cadence with the different lines of business. Because me as an individual, uh, I'm not great at everything. And I think you need to understand what are you good at and what you're not so good at and pull those people in so they can enable your team to do even more. And then Fridays is typically deal reviews, you know, pipeline reviews. Um, ideally, I have my one-on-ones on a Friday, but that doesn't happen all the time. So it's during the whole week. Um, and, uh, and and we'll have that on a regular as well. And when you think about some of the biggest drains either on your time today or historically that you've been able to learn from, you know, what, what are some of the bigger drains or, or misses that you see leaders have uh, that mean that ultimately they don't have the level of control over their calendar that it sounds like you now have? Yeah, I think for in particular, like new sales leaders, well, what, one of the things that I, I find is um, they spend their time essentially being these super AEs, right? So they typically, you know, any meeting that comes up, anything that they can do to solve the problem for their reps, they'll do it. And they're often in, in this reactive mode rather than being proactive and being conscious around what should you be spending your time doing. And, um, you know, there's so many time management techniques out there. Um, you know, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. He's got the matrix. That's a really good one, urgent, non-urgent, to prioritize, you know, how you should structure your diary. I use a slightly different one I actually learned from our CEO. Um, and it's listing out as a VP, what are the mandatory activities that are really essential, like forecasting, leadership meetings, my town halls. And I get those blocked out in my diary for the whole kind of year. Then I've got these high leverage um, categories of activities. And those things could be like training and development. It could be like organizing team prospecting days, because these things will ultimately lead to, to growth and development of our people. Then I've got low leverage activities and these are things for example mentorship calls from another region um, or attending an event they're not going to directly really impact our bottom line growth and so it's kind of something i encourage new sales leaders to do problems because your people get too reliant on you pull you into deals and you're not coaching and developing and helping their growth because you're doing it all for them that's one of the biggest drainers that i see uh especially new sales leaders do yeah that's uh that that's wow. a very interesting one i like the the breakdown it sounds like from your your ceo your leadership team uh thinking about the high leverage activities i i'm forever talking about the importance and the value the intrinsic value on time right it's the one thing that we we can't manufacture more of and and we don't know how much more of uh, we all have right uh, and so you know people sometimes uh, are just far too wasteful with it when it's just such a critical important resource and so uh, I, i'm very maniacal about how can we claw back even a minute of time that we can then redistribute to revenue generating activities or, or things that really truly move the needle for whatever campaign we have top of mind at the moment i, I want to shift gears now moy into talking a bit more about your thoughts and, and best practices when it comes to actually winning business uh, starting with any core principles, frameworks, ways of thinking uh, that have really underpinned uh, some of your more sizable wins for either for yourself or for your team. Just talk to us about some of those core principles, frameworks or beyond. Yeah, great question. So this is something that I've seen in all big monstrous deals that have closed. The first thing is that reps do incredibly well is they prepare. They prepare so thoroughly. And it's not the type of preparation that most people do, which is go on LinkedIn, look at their LinkedIn profile and whatnot. This really dissects you understanding their business before you approach any organization, actually understanding 
the business value drivers. What is it that they do? How do they make money? What does the CEO talk about? What is priority for them? There is so much information out on the web, so much information that it is your duty as a sales rep to have done all your research and to, before you walk into the doors of that prospect, you should know so much about that organization. You should live and breathe their mission statement. You should understand their priorities. You should understand what's the, what's the latest news of their organization. And you should be hypothesizing. This is based on the challenger uh, sale, right? Um, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we, we use as well. Um, and actually understanding and hypothesizing what is it that their business objective is? Is it revenue, growth, or associated with cost or risk? What is that ultimate business driver and that business goal that they're trying to do? Then it's trying to figure out what is the most important thing if you're sending to the CIO? What is it that's the most important thing that the boss has asked the CIO to deliver upon? Then it's hypothesizing, well, if it's digital transformation, let's say, what are all the associated problems and initiatives that could be associated with digital transformation? And you can do this all online. You can do this before you even go into it. Then you are in a position of being a much more consultative sales rep when you go into the doors of that organization and that person. And by you knowing this and you explaining what you think their problems are and you think their objectives are, that builds such a differentiated proposition for you as a person, as a sales rep, because what you're doing is you're telling them, you, you're showing them what you know and you're showing them I know you. That differentiates so many salespeople. And so that's one of the big things. So preparation is a massive, massive aspect of you wanting to sell big. I don't think you necessarily have to do that if you want to just sell a quick buck, right? Because you really immerse yourself into the organization. Then it's really around rallying up the troops within your organization by being almost like a, a slick politician, so to speak, because you're this internal person where you're actually having to, to, to win the hearts and minds of individuals within the organization to get on board to serve this client because you've uncovered or validated what their critical priorities are. You brought some value. You may have challenged their thinking about what their challenges should be, what should be keeping them up, up at night, because this is what your peers are challenged with as well. And so when you do that and you can bring this collaborative team together to the table, then that's how you start to, you know, really start to build value in the mind of the buyer. And then, you know, urgency wise as well, you know, you've got to have some relevant hooks where you can drive that deal forward because you now fully understand what really is on top of mind of the CIO or whoever you're selling to and their boss. And so, you know, one of the critical things that we coach a lot on is power and urgency. And oftentimes, especially as deals are being scrutinized with this economic climate, you're having to go up, even for smaller deals, up towards the CEO and the board of directors. And you've got to build the level of competence and understanding of that organization and the champion for you to either go together or for you to go to the decision makers, to the actual power and present why you should be selected versus, uh, versus others. And your proposal is definitely going to be aligned to revenue, cost and risk because that's the most important thing that CEOs really care about right now. Moy, so much gold in everything that you just shared. So much gold on on that first point around prep. Incredibly important. Uh, another angle that I often like to talk to around the importance of prep is that great prep drives conviction in a salesperson and also in sales leaders. Uh, because the more time you spend truly understanding a customer's current state coming out with a hypothesis or a defined point of view around how you may be able to help, um, that breeds conviction. And that conviction sends you much further up the way to actually establishing that trusted advisor type of status that all of us are often pursuing. Um, so another angle on why the importance of prep is, is, is there. Also that point around rallying the troops as you described it internally, it's that point around building internal champions, right? And people that will really 
evangelize the campaigns that you're seeking to drive internally and and you've got to put in work to do that right i think there's there's too many reps that get into a deal and then just make asks of internal departments but they, they haven't done the work in the run-up to that to foster and forge great internal relationships right you, you need to have people on your side to help to create internal groundswell so that you can move further, faster, and more effectively and, and more efficiently a few years totally in agree. that. Um, so, actually, yeah. just, just on that, sorry to interrupt, Alex. It's yes. a really tac tactful type of thing that new reps can do when they join an organization. They need to understand who the different service lines that are going to support them on deals to deliver POCs or technical valuation or whatever it may be. And to differentiate yourself, why not? Grab them, grab a coffee with them, pay for a coffee, get to know them before you need them. Take the time to learn about them, understand why they join the organization. What is it that they're trying to get out? What are their drivers? You know, seek to understand before you pitching what it is that you need them for. And so I always advise that to all of our new hires. There's different lines of business. Get to know them, get to schedule 30 minute calls with them before you desperately need them to help close a deal or progress a deal. And so you have to build, like you said, build that personal brand. People buy from people. And so that's a really simple way to differentiate yourself. Absolutely. Very, very well said. And Moy, when you just think back through your own time, your own career, whether it's recent or, or further back, uh, and you think of a, a deal that maybe encapsulates some of the things that you've spoken about, uh, could you talk to a deal that's top of mind that, again, encapsulates some of those ingredients just to bring some of this to life? Yeah, I mean, there's so many. I mean, e even this year, actually, just lately, we we've closed some monster deals and, and everything that I've talked about, the best practices, been applied to the T. But the one that the one that really sticks in my mind, um, that's a personal favorite of mine, is with one of my sales reps at the time. He was selling to um, a locally family-owned business, very large, multi-billion dollar organization, and did all the right things, did all the right best practices, you know, did the prep, convinced the CIO. We had everything done. We, we delivered phenomenal capability presentations. The delivery team did a wonderful job. And we're the last week of the year, and this deal would have taken this rep to President's Club. And so everything is all good. You know, everything's going all in the right direction. And, um, and so what had happened two days before we were expecting the signed agreement, the PO to book and celebrate, we get an SMS message. And he says, um, you know, thanks so much. You guys have done a wonderful job. Everything was on point, but it's not going to happen. It's impossible for us to get this deal. I remember him saying it's impossible to get this deal done now. And there were some budgetary constraints or whatever it is. And so we were so disheartened. But what we did is we just wanted to get in front of them. And so we'd earned trust. We'd earned enough um, rapport and, you know, that because obviously you're demonstrating, you know, their business, then we've done a lot for them. And so the CIO said, okay, fine, I'll get you a come, you can meet, let's see what we can do. You know, I'm telling you, it's impossible. Just have that as an expectation. So we went to go see them and we were just, we didn't really have a plan. We were just trying to figure out what was going on. And so I went with him and, uh, you know, we're discussing things and we're, we're listening to him. We're trying to understand where is the blockage. We understood the financial controller was blocking this because he didn't want this thing to go through. Anyways, as we're in the office, the financial controller is walking by. And because we had built this type of relationship with the CIO, we demonstrated such great stuff. He called the financial controller and he said, look, these are the guys, you know, from so-and-so, Gartner, we're, we're trying to purchase. So can we, can we make something happen? <laughs> One thing led to another. We came up with a solution. And the, the next day um, was the last working day of the year. And we're chasing, you know, the, the CIO and, uh, you know, nothing's coming through. And we literally stayed in the office until 11, uh, sorry, 1030 at night. And, you know, the New Year's Day next day. And we're like, gosh, what's going on? And I said, let's have a little bit of fun. You know, what have we got to lose? Send them a selfie and just say we're still waiting for the, the, the signed contract and PO. Half an hour later, we got the signed contract and we got the PO, which is absolutely unheard of. And that wow. was such a great moment um, for, for the rep because, you know, not, not only did it demonstrate perseverance, never giving up, being creative, but also he got what he deserved. And the client was super happy with getting it on board as well. And so for me, 
that's probably one of the most memorable deals uh, in, in us closing. I, l- I love that story. I, l- I love everything about it. The uh, the selfie at the end, especially, is uh, is awesome. And as you say, creativity, being tenacious, running all the way through the tape. I often say, right, not just get into the fun finish line, but run through the tape. And uh, you guys did an incredible job there. So fantastic. Moy, I- I've got one final question for you. And that question is, what what is the single best piece of advice that you'd give to any emerging sales leader out there that's listening that wants to up level in their career? Great question. Um, I think one of the pieces of advice I would say is take personal accountability in investing in yourself, even as a sales leader. I think that constant approach to learning like you alex you know you've got all these coaches invest in the coach invest in development in yourself identify areas that you want to get better in because you've got to have a self-reflection as to what you're good at and what you might not be so good at figure out how you can amplify those strengths and how you can plug some of those gaps and so really be intentional and purposeful to go and work on yourself and then the second thing i would say is um if you're a sale, new sales leader, learn to become a really good coach. You know, you've got into this role because of your experience and your sales accolade, which is great. That's not necessarily what makes a great sales leader. And so learn the skills of what it requires to be a great coach because you're trying to empower and lift up the skill set of your team. And so they're the two things that I would say for any emerging sales leader. That's a fantastic way to finish, Moy. Have you enjoyed being on? Yeah, it's been great. Thanks so much for having me, Alex. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been a real pleasure. Now, to anyone out there that's been listening, I hope that you've enjoyed this week's episode. If so, please take a moment to like, comment, share, and subscribe with a colleague. And if you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms, please take some time to leave us a five-star review to help us grow our reach. Again, thank you.